Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Today's webinar puts practitioners from America's biggest brands in the hot seat to help you understand how to get your foot in the door and stand out. Whether you're seeking internships or uh, whether you're looking for a full-time position, we're going to walk you through at least three ways that should help you get your resume to rise to the top of the stack. My name is Dr. Kay Sweetser, and I am from San Diego State University. This webinar is being hosted by the Glenn M. Broom Center for Professional Development in Public Relations in partnership with PRSSA. Dr. Glenn Broom is considered the professor of the profession because he literally wrote the textbook on public relations. Nearly every PR practitioner still has his textbook, Effective Public Relations, on his or her desk today. Dr. Broom taught at San Diego State University for more than 30 years. He focused on improving the profession by improving the people within it. That same approach is how the Broom Center carries on the legacy of Dr. Broom. We continue his work to elevate the profession, and we see the best way to do that is by investing in you. You, the people of PR who are out there using initiative, hustling, and showing grit. The Broom Center invests in you by offering great webinars like this one, supporting PRSSA students by paying the fee for the Certificate in Principles of Public Relations, and offering network op networking opportunities. And hey, if you have any ideas about how we can help you, then you should just ask. We encourage you to share your outtakes from today on social media. Please use our hashtag 3P Career Tour or tag at Broom Center to join in the conversation. Our panel is gonna start as a moderated conversation and then we're gonna open it up to Q&A. So that we can cover as many topics as possible, we aren't gonna spend a long time on introducing each panelist. And instead, I encourage you to download the speaker program. There you'll find out about their careers, you'll see their social handles, and you'll be able to connect with them on LinkedIn. We just tweeted out the speaker bios from the at Broom Center Twitter account, so you can find them there. And if you have any questions, just type them in the QA box, and when we get to the QA portion, we'll uh, get those on to the panelists. Our moderator today is Scott Pansky, who co-founded Allison & Partners. Launched a week before the September 11th terrorist attacks, Allison & Partners grew in less than 20 years into a top global PR firm with offices in the coolest cities in the world. He knows what it is like to work through circumstance and economic trials. Scott was a student of Dr. Broom, where he says he was pushed to constantly be his best professional. He's no stranger to rolling up his sleeves and standing out in the crowd. Scott keeps that Broom legacy alive by paying it forward through his mentoring, just as Dr. Broom mentored him. Thanks, Kay. It's a pleasure to speak with everybody today and, and bring together such a, a great uh, group of folks on the phone. Uh, as starting off, I think it's, it's phenomenal that we had more than 280 folks register for this conversation. We have representation from more than 90 colleges from across the country. So kudos to everybody uh, who signed up and uh, participating in today's call. I, uh, you know, when Kay and I started talking about this a while ago, for me, it was really going back to the spirit of Glenn. He was such a, a great mentor and a good friend that it was always looking, what else can we do to help others? And when I looked at, when I came out of school uh, back in 1991, we were going through a real estate recession. It was really bad. I had a lot of people telling me, don't even try and go into PR look into other fields, try and get other jobs. And I was like really determined and this was something I wanted to do. So I had to be persistent. Uh, and that's part of what today is all about is persistence. That meant doing a retail job. That meant getting an internship. In my internship, I, you know, I was a year out of school when I got that internship. And it was based on a project that I wrote when I was a student at San Diego State. So I'm very grateful for that experience. And then uh, Dr. Broom called me up one day at my internship and he said, hey Scott, there's an alumni that's looking for somebody to work at a small firm in San Diego called the Gable Group. 
uh, I went in for my interview and the person I was interviewing with was a gentleman named Scott Allison. And 30 years later, Scott and I are still together uh, with our own agency. So I just want to thank everybody for participating today. And what I'd like to do is kind of just do a recap for, of what we're going to cover, and then I'm going to turn it over to our panelists. So to us, what we really want to do is provide real-world information and real-world counsel for you. Uh, we had taken all of your questions that you provided us when you signed up for this workshop, and we've kind of narrowed down to about five categories. Number one was careers in technology, entertainment, consumer and in the agency life. So we've got great representation from all of those categories. It's things of wanting to know what we look for from candidates for jobs. So we'll share that with you. You'd like to know what stands out, uh, whether from an interview or from your resume, from your cover notes, you want to understand how and what we're looking at during that time frame. What turns somebody on, what turns them off? Uh, how can you get your foot in the door? What are unique ways of doing that? And then uh, what can you do if you can't get an internship? Because obviously we're going into one of the worst job markets in history. And so when we look at that, you know, what's really going to help drive all of this is relationships and how you build those relationships. And they have to be very authentic relationships. And we'll spend a lot of time talking about that. The group of folks that you're going to be hearing from are all personal friends that have been built over years and time. Uh, and what we're going to start with the first question uh, actually comes from uh, Genevieve from Bucknell University, in which she asks, she would like to know from the panelists, where did they go to college and how did they start their careers? So with that, uh, Dee, uh, I'd love to turn it over to you. Great. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad to see you guys today. Um, I'm Deanna Yamamoto, and I actually am a graduate of USC um, from the School of Communications. Um, and my first real job was at a local boutique here in Los Angeles, a firm called Berkmer and Klein. And they had just merged with a um, bigger national firm called Golan Harris. Um, and it was about a week uh, before graduation when I told my parents I was taking this job and that my position was going to be the receptionist. Uh, because at that time, uh, you had to be a receptionist before you could become an account coordinator. And I think the clean version of what my parents said was, what? <laughs> so four years of school, you know, graduated, and then I would, wanted to be a receptionist at this great firm. Um, but I took a really big chance with that job, um, and I don't think most people would consider doing that. Um, but it actually showed me a lot about the inner workings of the agency. It gave me access to an exposure to all the people from the founders to finance to all levels of the account team. And it really paved the road for a great foundation for my career. Um, and it gave me access to all of some of the best people and to learn from some of the best people in the business. Um, little did I know many years later that my first boss um, at Berkmer Klein Golan Harris after several stints at other agencies and many, many, many years later, um, would call me and recruit me back to a firm now called Golan to be the managing director. So there's a lot of parallels between I started when Scott started, you know, being coming into the workplace in a recession and trying to think a lot about the type of job and how you might get your foot in the door. It might not be something conventional, but it should definitely be something that you consider a much wider option, uh, panel of options than you might have before. Um, and the moral of the story, I think, might be, you know, you, know, you should be nice to everybody because you never know who's going to be your boss someday. Thanks, Dee. And what's it's great, you know, uh, when I was an account coordinator many years ago, Dee and I used to uh, share a, a mutual event and we became friends and that relationship has lasted for years. So she's a pure testament to what she talked about in building relationships. Hey, Matt, why don't we go to you, bud? Hey everyone, um, Matt Prince here from Taco Bell. Thanks so much for, for having me. Um, so my, I went to school at Cal State Fullerton, go Titans. Um, and my first job was actually um, a byproduct of my time there. Um, I took an internship with an adjunct professor um, at the time who was working with the city of Anaheim um, in the mayor's office. And I got to do that almost for a full year, which ended up turning into a full-time position 
and then I got recruited from there to join um, the County of Orange and it started my, my career. So um, again, it started with PR SSA, it started with Cal State Fullerton, um, and from there it kind of uh, blossomed into my, my career. Awesome, thank you. And you guys have all seen that Taco Bell is just doing some phenomenal uh, cutting edge promotions and marketing. So uh, appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us. Anaik, why don't we hear about Google and how you got yourself started? Hi everyone, uh, I'm Anaïk van der Weed. I work for Google. In spite of my Swiss last name, I was born and raised in Brazil. Um, and this is you know, where I started at Google. So I went to school there, got my degree in journalism, um, and then we went on to, um, to do grad school in mass communications. Um, I started my career, you know, the sort of more traditional route. So, well, my actually first job was at a bookstore, but after that I got um, two, I did two different internships who, that were incredibly valuable to me. The first one was in broadcast, working at a big TV station in Brazil. Um, it's, it's, at least in Brazil, it's a very old school industry. So it's a lot of that culture of, you know, interns just do whatever, right? Like don't ask too many questions, just help solve the problems. Um, and, you know, don't, don't bring any more problems to me. So that helped me develop that attitude of, you know, how can I find solutions and bring different options? Um, and, after that, I went on to an internship in corporate communications at this telecommunications company. Uh, think of it as the equivalent to T-Mobile in Brazil. So they were very big as well. And my then boss, I was, you know, this is probably my last year in school. My then boss said, hey, listen, it's great what you're doing here. But if you really want to learn how to do PR, go work for an agency, right? Like go work for an agency, go get yourself uh, uh, some clients, small clients, learn the hustle, learn how to do PR for, you know, any and all industries. And then, then you might be ready to take your pick and see where you want to go with your career. Um, I'm so glad she did that because then I worked at agencies for a while. And I do think that I learned so much from there. Um, and it's where I, you know, ended up focusing more on tech and my way into tech was actually in B2B communication. So um, a lot of um, the tech companies back then were trying to figure out how to talk to advertisers and clients. Hello, Taco Bell. Um, hello, Disney. And, you know, who also, you know, the bread and butter of the business. But at the time, they were just thinking about the technology of it and not thinking about the business side of it. Right. So that was my in into tech and fast forward a decade later. Here I am. Awesome. Thank you so much. Nicole. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Nicole Duong. I work at Netflix. And my first job was at an agency called NPRM Communications. Uh, they focused on film, digital media technology, TV publicity. Um, and I actually got my start there because I was an intern my senior year. I rotated through the various departments and um, Mirror what Anai said, just gained invaluable experience working at an agency and working through various different types of publicity. Uh, but after I graduated, I landed a job in the film department and have been involved in some form of film publicity ever since. Awesome, man. Nicole, I have to say, uh, used to work for us and then uh, she got recruited away from our next speaker, Mr. Bass, Chris. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. So I went to school at UCLA, and um, my first job was at Warner Brothers. Um, I was doing volunteering for a charity event at UCLA, and one of my responsibilities was um, to recruit corporate sponsors. And I went out to hundreds of sponsors, uh, including Taco Bell, uh, and uh, Warner Brothers actually came back and agreed to be a, a sponsor for the event. And through that relationship, I met some people at Warner Brothers. And through networking with them, they let me know that they're, they do college internships. And they had approximately 30 college interns and asked if I'd be interested in being the UCLA intern. And I said, sure. So I, I interviewed, got that internship. And I was surprised to find out that uh, none of the interns ever 
came into the Burbank office and I figured since I was in LA, why wouldn't I at least try to, to get in there and see if I could meet some people and learn more what it's like. And so I asked and they, uh, and no one had done that before. So they found a tiny dirty cubicle that they were using for storage and cleared it out and let me uh, come in there a couple days a week. And I, essentially volunteered for everything possible to opening, you know, the doors to cars as they arrived at red carpets to any grunt work. Again, this was an unpaid internship that they were unpaid at the time. And, uh, but it was such a great learning experience that after doing the internship for two years, uh, Warner brothers offered me a job and I got, uh, into Warner right out of school. I worked there for a year. I transferred to Disney where I, I, I worked at Disney and uh, film uh, publicity. And uh, I did have the opportunity uh, to, to leave Disney, work at a small PR firm um, where Anna Eek was talking about the hustle. That was definitely the hustle uh, and learning that there was, there was no job um, you know, too small for everybody to jump in and pitch in. Again, it was a, a small PR agency of only 10 people. Um, I did that for a couple of years, went to 20th Century Fox, and through the Disney acquisition, find myself back at the Walt Disney Company. That's awesome, Chris. It, it, the power of networking is is a testament here. It's, I've known Chris uh, for nearly 30 years. Uh, I made a cold call to Chris when he was working at Disney for a point of purchase display from Beauty and the Beast because my wife and I happen to have a Beauty and the Beast wedding and Chris was super nice to send that to me and we stayed in touch for years and then uh, ended up hiring us when he was at Fox. So it was great. Um, thanks, Chris. I appreciate that. Uh, next question comes to us from Ian at Cal State Long Beach. Um, what have you been doing uh, in your career that you consider was your like most standout moment? Was it one of the programs that you're most proud of? And Chris, why don't we stay with you and we'll go back? Um, sure. Well, it's it's hard to pick your favorite campaign because they're they're all your children. But uh, I think back when I was at Disney, one of the most popular uh, mantras was the only in Hollywood um, publicity stunts that took place. And I was fortunate enough to do a couple that were uh, honored by the LA Publicity Club. Uh, one of them was for a Disney movie that I'm sure you've never seen called Iron Will about the Iditarod race. And so I figured why not do a race down Hollywood Boulevard where I dumped 20 tons of snow and did an authentic dog sled race down Hollywood Boulevard uh, to promote that movie. Um, it uh, it certainly was a was a really proud moment, and uh, I could I could bore you with many more others, but that one that one definitely stands out just because it was uh, you know I will I'll tell you this it, it it stands out because it was very successful. It also stands out because I never thought of what to do with the snow after the race. Um, I figured we just shoveled it to the curb, and I figured it's L.A. where it's 80 degrees. We got national coverage about how hot it was in January, and uh, I thought it would melt, but by packing it all together against the curb, it actually lasted for three days, and I got in trouble with the city of Los Angeles, so lesson <laughs> and learned. You, and you can watch the movie today on Disney Plus, I think. Nicole. I, I'm sure it's there. <laughs> <laughs> also hard to pick a favorite, but one sticks out because it involves you, Scott, and also Chris. Um, but in 2016, 2016, for the Peanuts movie, um, I, I don't remember how we landed on this idea, but Chris had somehow secured a big red Snoopy house, and we decided why not bring this dog house or Snoopy's house to the White House lawn for President Obama's last Easter egg roll. Easter egg, yeah, roll. Um, and also, this is just a great example of making sure you're keeping in touch with your network and the people you meet along the way, because I had, we didn't know how to get in touch with the White House. I didn't know where to start. There wasn't like a form you fill out. But I remembered that a client of mine when I was at NPRM worked in politics for a very long time. So I reached out to her and said, you know, I have this crazy idea 
can you do it? Can we do it? Do you know who to put me in touch with? And then through a series of maybe five, six emails, I eventually got to someone who worked closely with Mrs. Obama, who then forwarded me on to somebody who worked at White House events. And then in a matter of days, we had secured all the paperwork that we needed to secure to bring Snoopy to the White House. Um, and so I, you know, Scott told me I, I have to go. Chris made sure that Fox had the funds to let me go. And um, we brought Snoopy to the White House and it was amazing. And um, it Who'd was a great- you get to hang out with? You had some celebrities I think you got to hang out with too, if I remember correctly. Yes, I spoke words to Beyonce. That was amazing. Um, I, but the Obamas were, I, I was so close to them and truly probably the highlight of my career. There were just, it, because we were in a tent in the back, because we were staff, there were just people coming through there all the time. And um, it was just great visibility for the campaign, but also just one of my personal favorites. And um, yeah, truly just special. Thank you. Anik, how about you? Um so hard to pick. I was thinking back as you guys were talking and so much of my personal proud moments are more linked to how we got to an actual campaign than what happened there. So, so much of the internal um, hoops that you have to go through and, you know, getting everyone on the same page and sort of like that feeling of working together um, and overcoming challenging is what is so rewarding to me. Um, if I had to pick one uh, that stands out, I think it would be the uh, Connecting America Business program that we ran a few years ago with, um, with Google, which was about going to small cities in America and then running programs with policymakers where we would host these events and have people sign up for learning how to make a, build a website and what you could do online and then running their first online ads. And what was so great about that is that, you know, so easily we get caught up in our uh, bubble being, you know, here in LA or in, in Silicon Valley or even New York. But I went to the heart of America and which to me was a, you know, a brand new experience. And I met so many people and it helped me step out of the bubble a little bit. Scott, you and I were talking a little bit about that. I think that, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm trapped in this bubble, especially in the tech world where everyone, you know, is living and breathing the same subject and sort of expect everyone to understand what we're talking about. And then when you step out of it, um, you sort of see your company and your brand through other people's eyes. And a lot of it falls into place. And I think that you bring them back that knowledge inside the company and you help build that brand from a better perspective. So often I feel like as comms professionals are the canary in the gold mine um, and we have to act like one. So that experience of, you know, being in smaller cities across the country was super invaluable to me. That's awesome. Thank you, Matt. All right, so yeah, so many to choose from, um, but I think my favorite would have to be the recreation of the Taco Bell in the Demolition Man movie. So most of you probably don't even know what the movie is, Demolition Man. It came out long before many of you were born. It's about 27 years old, but it starred Sandra Bullock, Sylvester Stallone, Wesley Snipes. It was, it was a box office hit. It was huge. And it still to this day was probably some of the best product placement that I've ever seen. It was a Warner Brothers movie. Um, but Taco Bell in the movie was the only restaurant that, would, that ever existed. The movie itself took place in the future in 2032. So in the future, all restaurants were Taco Bells. Um, and it's just a terribly awful but amazingly good movie. So if you want to check it out, I encourage you to do that. Um, and in the movie, there's a fine dining Taco Bell restaurant that the characters go to. And it was my lifelong passion, especially since I started at Taco Bell, to recreate this Taco Bell. Um, and so um, after four years of pushing and pitching this idea, um, I finally got the green light to do it. We recreated the restaurant, partnered with Warner Brothers, did it at Comic-Con in 2016, um, had a six hour long wait for consumers to get in um, for three straight days. Um, it was a fine dining Taco Bell experience. It was so cool. Um, and had Wesley Snipes come by, that was pretty cool too. Um, but to me, I think the reason why that was so special in my mind um, was because the amount of times I heard no um, on this idea. 
I, I think, you know, you obviously need to recognize when no means no, and it's not a good idea and you, you're just being stubborn. But this for me, I felt was such a strong um, piece for the brand. And um, I was so passionate about it. I kept pushing and pushing in it. Finally, the time was right. It was the 25th anniversary of the movie. It lined up perfectly with a product announcement that we were doing the launch of our nacho fries. Um, and so I tied it into the movie script and basically told the pre version of the movie of how Taco Bell ended up winning the franchise wars and being the only restaurant in the future. Um, and so it was just an all around amazing opportunity. Um, so yeah, that's it. Very cool. Thanks, Matt. Hey, wrap us up there. Yeah. So I have a long career at all agencies, so lots of great moments, but um, I'm going to have to pick one that has been of late and it's for Luna Bar, um, which if you're not familiar is a energy bar for women, made by women. Um, and so they've had a long history actually in the entertainment industry um, to support women in independent film. Um, and so they had done a big film um, uh, festival for many, many years. And we were trying to evolve that and to make it current in the conversation, the cultural conversation. And it just so happened about three or four years ago. So you guys might not remember this, um, it was pre Me Too, but they were started talking at um, some of the big award shows about the importance of equal pay for women. So try, as we looked at the program, you know, in supporting women in film, we said, you know, we should, here's a topic that we have um, credibility and authenticity in talking about. And so equal pay became um, one of those missions that we had for the brand. And so the first year we supported Equal Pay Day and did a really great program. And we thought, okay, we, we tried and tried to make sure that they stuck with it. We said, it's not a one-year program. As a brand, you should support this. It is a purpose and a cause that is authentic to you. It will help women, et cetera. So three years later, um, we had the great um, opportunity to partner with the US women's soccer team as they were going into World Cup last year. Um, and we actually, the proudest moment of my career was sitting in the room and telling these women that we were going to give them uh, a basically a roster bonus of $31,000 plus um, per person, which would make their pay equal to the men's U.S. soccer team. And the, the amount of um, gratitude and just true amazement that a company would um, take the time and the effort and really um, promote the fact that, you know, how important equal pay was to women was a, it was just a fantastic moment. And, um, you know, having the, basically the, the wave to bring together sort of a, a client, a purpose, um, and a very topical cultural conversation um, in multiple years, and we're gonna continue to evolve it this year, um, was just, I, I don't think there's a better way for me to retire at some point from this business saying that, and I know Scott, it's near and dear to his heart to, you know, be able to bring a purpose to life for such an important cause. As a father of three uh, young <laughs> ladies, absolutely so. Yeah. Uh, so let's go in a different direction here. Uh, and we'll call this speed dating. Uh, I'm gonna ask you a series of questions from different students. And this is all about career opportunities and how I find a job and, and what I could do to stand out. So the first one I'm gonna uh, ask you is from Aubrey from San Diego State University. What is the best way to present a resume without or with PR experience? There's a lot of folks who have a passion for PR but might not have taken the courses, and obviously there are those that have. Uh, what advice would you uh, give them? So uh, why don't we start off with Matt? Yeah, I think the good thing about public relations and communications is that the qualities that come along with being successful in the field are, they transcend the communications major or the public relations major. Um, you know, I waited tables through college. So much of what I did waiting tables, um, I took in into my career as a public uh, relations practitioner. So um, I think one of the easiest things to do when you're applying for a job, if you're applying for 10 jobs, you should have 10 different resumes and each one should be tailored to the job you're applying for. The way I look at it, it's kind of like an open book test. You should have the job application um, on one side and you should have your resume on the other and you're pulling keywords um, that the resume or that the application is looking for. Um, and you can do that with the jobs that you've had, whether it be serving tables or um, uh, working in retail or volunteering or within organizations like PRSSA. There are elements of all of those things that will be in that application. You just need to kind of reword and wordsmith to match up with what those folks are looking for. Um, but everything is there um, and you just have to uncover it. 
Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, D, you see a ton of resumes. What do you think? I do. Um, and I think my best advice would be to talk about, especially from an agency perspective, um, how you've collaborated with a group of people, you know, in any shape or form. So whether it's at school in a classroom group for a project or, you know, project in your community or any of those things, um, because I think it's important um, to let your potential employers know, like, how do you collaborate with people? You know, when you did the project, what role did you take on? What did you learn about your leadership style? What did you learn about other people's style? And how did you work with them? Because that's, I think, what, what it's the sort of unwritten um, type that we're looking for. You know, that's what we do every day. We're always collaborating with people inside our agency, with our clients, with media, with, you know, any sort of group uh, across the board. So we want to make sure that we're finding some good collaborators and to be able to articulate that in a way um, that I think is, is very straightforward and uh, with some good examples would be something that I would look for in a resume. Uh, is there anything I could do in my cover letter that would help in that process as well? You know, does it matter the cover letter to the resume? Uh, I, I would, I usually just look at the resume because the cover letters don't usually say anything <laughs> of importance as far as I've seen. So I guess if you can tell a great story in a very short period of time, um, that would be really great. I mean, also, I think having a, knowing your elevator pitch, I thought a lot about, you know, when you applied for college, you wrote an essay that was, had to be a short essay about yourself and how you would stand out from the rest of um, the college applicants, it's similar, you know, to this, where it's like, know your elevator speech, be prepared, you know, how do you say it, and write it, say it, you know, practice it over and over again, you know, why are you a great fit, um, you know, is your employer looking for a self-starter, how are you a self-starter, just to be able to be able to write that, and then to also be able to say it to anybody, and everybody who will listen to you. That sounds good. Ani, how would you address that just to even get your foot in the door? I think it's so much of what uh, Matt and Deanne covered is important. And um, I was thinking, trying to put myself in the shoes of someone who's just coming out of college, you may feel like you don't have that experience or that you don't, you know, what am I going to even write about, right? Like I'm just getting started. But so often I feel like if you, if you dig deep, you find examples where you've shown certain skills that are required and I think that it, it can't help just to talk to other people. So talk to the people who know you and, you know, friends or families or uh, colleagues um, and, and ask, like, do you remember a time when, you know, you noticed this thing about me, right? Or do you remember an example? How would you describe me? What, what are some words that you would use to describe me? Find people that you trust, that you can ask those questions. Because I feel like often it's hard for us to develop that self-knowledge. And the first thing to me to before you, Put yourself out there is to sort of like get that internal perspective look inwards find what you know what is it that makes you feel good about yourself what are the things that you know you have the skills that you know you have and that you want to develop and once you feel good about that you have your elevator pitch like dan mentioned and that i feel it's a very first important first step excellent thank you chris uh, i've got a question from jasmine at kennesaw university what would you do if you were in our shoes during this pandemic to try and find a job? What would you do today? Well, it's, it's, it's certainly a very tough uh, time to be looking for a job. Uh, I would, if I were in your shoes, the one thing that I would do is um, mine, LinkedIn, and all the social media networks, because we're all out there, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, I would do that and I would um, passionately and proactively reach out for virtual coffee meets. Um, you could call them informational interviews, but I think a virtual coffee meet just sounds so much more um, inviting uh, where, um, you know, you get a chance uh, hopefully to get some people that will, uh, you know, make time available and give you some insights. Um, and leverage your connect your your network your connections. Um, certainly, as uh, as Matt and and Anik and and Deanne were saying about your resume, 
those are the you can showcase some of your networking in your resume by you know just trying to identify three references you know brand um, advocates for your brand your uh, your personal brand uh, people that might that that people that are doing the hiring may never call but might take notice of right so um, for me personally. Uh, on my resume, I try to include a filmmaker, uh, usually like a director I've worked with, um, a key media contact so that I can show, you know, a, a, an outlet or a media relationship, and then someone internally uh, that I've worked with, like, you know, Nicole, for example. And, um, you know, that's, that's leveraging my network. And I think if you're looking for a job, use social media, use LinkedIn, and leverage the network that you have to, to connect with people and start conversation. You know, a uh, question for everybody, kind of a, a quick yes or no is, can you share, uh, I've sent you my resume and I'm, I'm really kind of nervous and scared to send it to you, but I, I sent it out. If I'm looking interesting, you know, Chris, you just talked about social media. Are you gonna look at my Facebook or my Instagram or my, uh, you know, any other of my social channels to kind of learn more about me? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Nicole, is that a yes for you? I do. I do look at people's social profiles, but it's mostly because I, similarly to a resume, you kind of want to see, um, you know, what your interests are and it doesn't all have to relate to PR, but I'd like to get to know the person and I like to try to see that person on a resume. Um, and I wanted to add to Chris's point to, I think the, Finding a job, of course, is it can be a challenge, but I think don't scare yourself into not applying for something just because you see a job description and there might be a thing or two on there that you think you don't have the experience in. I think for me, I wanted so badly for my first job to be a perfect fit, and I didn't realize at the time what that even meant for me, and I probably scared myself out of applying for jobs that I should have applied for. Um, and it's very cliche, but you do miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So don't ever let fear of a job description scare you into applying um, to a job or reaching out to someone for Nicole, a coffee or informational. Nicole, everybody's signing up for that job. It, it's listed. There's no way I can get that job. This person's smarter than me. This person has more experience than me. How, how do I break through that clutter? There's a lot of FOMO out there uh, that I know scares people away. Yeah. I, you know, I would say I'm, I'm using my own experience. Um, I work in the awards department on Netflix. I did not have any previous experience in awards. I knew that people wanted this job very badly and I only knew what I can contribute. And I think, you know, it's even if you don't have the experience in awards, taking um, a piece of what everyone's been saying, you communicate really well. You know how to communicate really well. You have all these examples of um, times you've worked creatively or times that you've been scrappy. Um, I think there are maybe little things that, little skills that people have that you don't think about. Like, can you put together a PowerPoint presentation really well because you took a class and didn't think it would be relevant anymore, but it could be. Um, and I think even though I didn't have this experience, I just went in with the knowledge of the field that I was going into. And I think ultimately, I personally feel that's what maybe put me over the edge because I remember very vividly my last interview with um, the vice president of our, the department I now work under. She looked at my resume once and then asked me about the competition. She asked me all these questions about the field that I was going into and that's why she hired me. Not because I had experience in awards because I didn't, but it was because I knew the field that I was going into and I informed myself as best I could. And I think she saw that and realized like this person can succeed here because they are, they have an interest and they want to learn. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, Ani, you, you see a lot on, on social media. What, what's kind of your take there on, on how, somebody can stand out? I think um, it's, 
I'm very skeptical. And, and if you think of social media, it's so different, right? Like what your profile on LinkedIn will probably be very different from what you're showcasing or sharing on Instagram versus Twitter, right? Because they serve different purposes and, you know, and you have different connections as well. So of course, LinkedIn is more about packaging your brand, like your professional brand, right? And, um, but I do think that with, with other stuff, um, it's, it, so much of it is about being authentic to your own self and to your brand and uh, make like sort of like exploring, leaning in those strengths that you find, which is why I go back to my earlier point about crafting that Deanne called elevator pitch. I'm going to call your personal narrative. What does that look like? Right? Like what are your strengths? Who, who, who is the person that you are, growing to be or that you're striving to be. And I think that will naturally come through. Um, I also think that, you know, whenever I find, I find myself in working, starting a new role or, you know, working with new people, I do try to follow a lot of people that I, you know, know and admire. And I just like literally stalk them on Twitter or <laughs> LinkedIn or whatever they might be, because there's no, there's no shame in le learning from others just by, you know, but, but some of it will be just copy, right? Like you'll see something and it'll be like, oh, okay, I kind of, I see how this person talked about this here. And then, you know, next time you're in a meeting, maybe you repeat that, but then the, 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 you know, you do that two or three times and then you're sort of like, you find your grounding and you find your way of saying things, right? But you learn so much, especially when you're developing your executive presence, you, lunch, you learn so much from watching others and observing what they're doing and sort of incorporating bits and pieces of those different um, pieces of the puzzle. No, it makes a lot of sense. Hey, Dee, um, I'm, I'm going in and I'm, I'm putting together my resume and I'm trying to figure out what are the top skills. I've, I've got um, uh, uh, a question from Lucy at Belmont University. So what skills or certifications do you look for or recommend students put on their resume? So basically, it's how do I build my resume? What is it that you're going to look at the most in your decision-making process? Um, so not to be really tactical, but the first thing is, please don't have any typos. <laughs> what? A typo? It's very simple, but I can tell you that if I, there's one that comes across my desk with a typo, it goes in the trash because clearly, you know, we want people who are um, very diligent and who really care for the work and that their work reflects who they are. And so that's, that seems super simple, but it's just, it's something that I think we've seen happen a lot recently. Um, but beyond the collaboration that I talked about before, you know, I think that that's a really important skill to be able to articulate, um, but also sort of understanding, I think the broader market, um, as Anik was saying, that it's just, you know, how can you bring some knowledge about the broader space into, you know, what you can bring to the table? So I think a lot of resumes kind of look the same, you know, where's your knowledge and how does it show, you know, what you can, what you're going to do when you walk in the door for whoever you're, you know, whatever job you're applying for. Um, and I think said it great too, where you're thinking about like, who is the person that this, that, that they can become, the resume can become, not just what's on the resume. So you know, one of the questions that we ask, which sounds kind of morbid, <laughs> but it's a good one. It's, it's sort of like, what would, what would you want on your tombstone, right? And it gets people sort of thinking about like, what's, what's that end result, you know, that I want to see or say or have people say about me? Um, and it gets you into a different mindset, you know, how you might want to start thinking about your career, the types of jobs you want to take, you know, how you're presenting yourself. It's like when you're looking at the end result and, you know, how you want people to talk about you or what legacy, if you want to call it that, you want to leave, you know, that really changes the way that you might present yourself. That's awesome. Good advice. Matt, you're freaking Taco Bell, man. You're huge. It's got to be impossible to get a job at Taco Bell. Uh, what do I have to do to stand out on my resume? Same question. What is it that you're looking for? Yeah, resume, resumes are tough because I think everyone who's looking at them looks at them differently. Um, so what I'm about to say is just my sole perspective. Um, if your GPA is on there, take it off. I don't care. Um, you know, I never had a good GPA through college. I never found that as a defining moment for people. Um, so I take that off. Um, if your school is the top thing on there, I'd move it to the bottom. I want to focus on 
you as a person, the work that you've done, um, the experience that you have. Um, I also personally look for the things that I can't teach you. Um, so I can teach you about writing. I can teach you about graphic design to a certain extent. I can teach you about elements of these um, different programs, but I can't teach you work ethic. I can't teach you grit. I can't teach you interpersonal communication skills or writing. I can hone some of those things, but for the most part, I can't teach those. So for me, that's truly what I look for. Um, I think I would take a hard worker that has zero experience over someone who um, has kind of coasted by and has a lot of experience uh, any day of the week, because to me, that's, that's what kind of helped me get my foot in the door. Um, I will also say that of the jobs that I've had, my five, um, you know, jobs after graduation, none of them were, um, none, I got none of them because of my resume at all. It was all through networking and through relationship building and being recruited from a job I love to a job I love even more. So that was always my end goal. But um, from a resume perspective, um, really focus on the elements that showcase you and your true passion. So people like the hiring manager can kind of pick out what they want to see. So for me, again, it's showing the organizations, the volunteering efforts that you have, the experience or the classes that you took that would be specific to what the role you're applying for is. Um, to me, that's what is most important. Chris, would you like to add to that? Same thing, you're, you're Disney. What do I do? I, I don't have a lot to add to what, to what Matt said. I, I completely agree and, and uh, I, I look for the same things as well. Uh, I, I would, I, his comment that I would rather have somebody that has zero experience, but has the grit, determination, perseverance, and I would also add passion uh, for what you do uh, is what's most important. At, at Disney, when I tell people that I work at Disney, more often than not, I get the response, oh, the happiest place on earth. And it's this illusion that a PR job at Disney or Google or Netflix uh, are glamorous and you spend all day working with celebrities, but it's actually extremely hard and um, very challenging. And um, I generally look for people that are passionate about film and television and the entertainment industry and that passion and willingness to roll up their sleeves and do whatever it takes to be successful is, is what we're looking for. And I would look for ways to communicate that through your resume. The last thing, though, that Matt said, I agree. Every job, um, even from the beginning internship, was all through relationships. And I can't stress enough that relationships and networking are key to getting your next position, um, regardless of how amazing your resume looks. Awesome. Hey, um, Nicole and Anika, why don't you talk to us a little bit about informational interviews and the importance of getting those informational interviews. Because I can imagine to get in the door and Google or Netflix, again, all of you are with such large companies that it's gotta be very competitive and that resumes go to an HR department. Uh, what, do you take informational interviews and, and what do you do with that? So uh, why don't I start Nicole and then we'll go to Ani. I personally love doing informational interviews. I think that's how, to everyone's point, my many of my jobs were through relationships as well. Um, they're important because even if you don't see a position at Netflix that's right for you, or if there's nothing that you think you qualify for, it doesn't mean that something's not gonna open up. And having met you and having had a great conversation with you, um, and having you be in touch with me all the time, you're just constantly top of mind when I do see that something is open. Um, but we also have a great, we all of us have a great network too. And there might be something that, you know, Disney might be hiring for something. And I can tell Chris, hey, I met this person, um, he or she just graduated. And we had a great conversation. This person's a really hard worker, is really passionate about entertainment, loves Disney. Um, you might want to talk to her. I think, especially now, it's important. I think a lot of us are, I've done a few just via Zoom and Google Hangouts, and they've been great. And I think um, a lot of us kind of feel, um, you know, the stress and pressure that might be going on um, post-graduation. My sister's class of 2020 as well, so I get it from her all the time. Um, but definitely reach out and do them because you don't, again, you just don't know 
when your relationships are going to come in handy and and where these conversations are going to lead. Awesome. Uh, Anique, uh, what would you say? And we have a, a question, Ariana University of Oregon, about informational interviews. Uh, what are some of the questions uh, you enjoy that students ask you in those informational interviews? I love when people ask me questions. I've done, I can't even... <laughs> I have no idea how many interviews I've done at Google, but I, you know, I always leave some time at the end to let people ask me questions. I find that I learn more about a person by the questions that they're asking rather than by the answers they're giving me, uh, because it's sort of like, it shows me where their minds are at and, you know, what are the things that they value most. Um, so, you know, to Chris's earlier point, uh, definitely anything that signals passion for whatever it is that they do that might be, you know, related to um, something that we're looking for. So yes, of course, it's great if it's writing and, you know, in, in our case, if it's technology, but it could be something else, right? But then when you're showing that you're passionate about something and that, you know, that then that means you have a, you know, it, it pushes you forward, I immediately can see it being uh, relevant for work. And I would, I would also say, so I'd say, ask a ton of questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions, right? And even if the person don't open up this space for a lot of questions, if they're asking more of the questions, just say, can I ask more questions, right? I have a lot of questions. Ask about their day-to-day -day job. How is it, how is a day in a life for you? You know, what are the things that you like most about your job? What are the things that you don't like? Um, again, to, to, to Chris's point, like what is not so glamorous about your job, right? Like what makes it harder? What? Um, and I would also add on the networking point that at Google, and um, I don't know how Netflix works in that sense, but at least at Google, and I know a lot of tech companies, almost half of the people that we hire come through referrals. Um, so the, 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 the resumes that pop out are the ones that come through referrals. And those referrals don't need to be, hey, I've worked extensively with you, Nicole, so I can, you know, write you a work recommendation. It can be, hey, I know this person, right? We know each other personally. I know, you know, she's great. She's, you know, she strikes me as super smart and great to work with. So I wanted to, you know, recommend her for this position. And then, you know, it goes through HR, obviously, in all these departments. But the fact that you know someone uh, might be of help. Google is a hundred thousand employee company. So I'm sure you know someone that knows someone that works at Google, right? Like even there, if they're not, not in PR, you know someone. So maybe, you know, set up virtual coffee, have a conversation, and that can be a good start of it. That's awesome. We're getting close to the end of the conversation. And uh, I'm going to start back uh, with the end. I'm gonna, one last question, then I'll try and summarize a few things. Uh, we've asked you a lot. Uh, over the last hour, uh, what piece of advice would you give to the students uh, that I haven't asked or that you haven't shared yet that you think is really important for them uh, as a takeaway from today's conversation? Okay. Yeah, I think I just, I want to reiterate what Ani said, which is, I think, you know, everybody knows somebody, and I think it's really important for um, for you and everybody else just to be brave. Um, write down a list, a list of who you know and ask for introductions and ask for help. It's really uncomfortable and it's stressful and scary, um, but you'd be surprised at how many people really are willing to help and open doors for you. Um, you know, it can be, you know a bunch of professors, you know, you have parents, you have friends with parents, you've got um, who know people in the industry, you've met speakers, you've had internships, like anybody that you can think of, you know, just reach out to and, and ask if they can help make an introduction to you or to make a connection. Um, because like I said, everybody, everyone's willing to help. I'm, I do it all the time. People ask me, I've met with more people, had coffee with friends or relatives of, you know, someone's brother that, you know, was interested in the field and you know, we just, we want great people to come into our field. And so the more people we meet, the better off, you know, our staffs are as well. And so just don't be afraid because I, I know it's, it's hard to take that step to ask a favor, but it's not even a favor. Just all I ask people when I do things like this is just pay it forward. When it's your turn, you know, do the same thing. And that's, that's all that, you know, most people want. So be brave, be brave and ask for help. Awesome. People like to help people. That's for sure. Anaïque? Um, 
One thing that I wanted to add is, you know, someone told me a very long time ago, um, find yourself um, trusted, trusting, uh, trusted advisors for your career. Um, and um, I like how Chris was talking about having someone that it's a filmmaker, someone that it's in the media industry, and I can't remember the third one, like a colleague maybe. Um, but I like that. And I, I, I have mine. I have people, you know, I have, you know, a journalist friend and someone from the field and a former colleague, people that I always talk to. And it's not just about, or it's never actually about helping me find jobs, but it's about bouncing ideas off. Whenever I find myself in crossroads in my career, I go to these people, like I have lunch and I, I share with them and I'm like, I don't know if I should take this job. Should I not take this other job? Like, I don't know if I should, you know, insist on this company. Like, should I try to do that? And I found that having those people that you trust can offer some really, really important um, advice. So I would suggest you build those relationships with people that you trust um, from uh, different areas. It's like building your own personal advisory board. Uh, and one of the things all the students you have is members of your local PRSA chapters that you can tap into as well. Hey Matt, what do you think? What's another piece of advice you'd provide? Yeah, um, I think for me, you know, I knew I was never the smartest person in the room. Um, I knew it'd be really hard to stand out in a resume. So I built my personal brand and my earlier career on like, what would it take to get a job without a resume? Um, and for me, that kind of started it. I want to be at the top of everyone's I know a guy list. And what that is, and I know some of the panelists have mentioned it of referrals. That's how every job opening works. It, it doesn't go to LinkedIn first. It doesn't go to the job board first. The hiring manager asks the team, say, hey, does anybody know anyone who would be good for this job? And then people say, yeah, I know a guy or I know a girl or um, no. And then it goes to the job board. So my goal was to be at the top of that list of, hey, I know a guy. Um, and that's kind of how my career progressed. Um, I think, think of your role or your um, kind of brand, a personal brand as your own business. I'll quote the famous um, philosopher Jay-Z. He talks about how he's, I'm not a businessman, I'm a business man. He himself is a business, he treats it that way. That's how I kind of treated my earlier career. Your personal brand is so valuable. Um, so make sure you treat it uh, as such. And the last thing I will say, I think a lot of people are very nervous, obviously going to the job market now, um, but do remember that you will probably be working for the next 45 years of your life, if not longer. On the grand scale of things, if you timeline that thing out, one year of craziness right now is going to be just a little bit of a blip on the radar. So um, just take that into context. You have a 45 years to work. Um, you're going to be okay. Take your time because you're going to get burned out anyways. So it's okay, though, if I do pro bono work for a nonprofit or do other type of jobs for the next year or so because the market might be tough, but don't give up on what I care about. Absolutely. I think a lot of places aren't hiring right now, but a lot of places are. Um, and people um, kind of look at this as a negative. Obviously, it is. But some of full-time positions might turn into internships. So those opportunities may open up differently for you. The different organizations, whether it be nonprofit, uh, may opening up different uh, opportunities. So just be smart about where you're looking and how you're looking, and uh, those opportunities will be there. Great. Thank you. Nicole? I don't know how much more I have to add to that. I We quoted Jay-Z, but I feel like the <laughs> through line is just network and don't be afraid to do that and don't be afraid to introduce yourself to people who you know there if there's a job there and they're doing a job that you think you want to do just reach out because the worst they can say is no and i hope that they don't i think generally again we all like to help people so just don't be afraid and just go for it awesome thank you chris i uh I agree that there's not a lot to add. The only thing I would say is um, two things real quick. One is look for those opportunities where you can reach out. So um, there are some people in the industry that I've always wanted to connect with. So, um, you know, there are, they are sometimes uh, speaking on panels at industry events, or sometimes they're in the news. And, you know, what have you got to lose by sending a note saying, uh, you know, introducing yourself and saying, I saw this article where you were featured and I, uh, I agreed with your comment and this is happening at our company. So, you know, sharing a personal story back to them, it, just take advantage, look for those opportunities. And Dee said this earlier, 
you never know who you meet who could potentially be your future boss. So just my only advice would be just be nice. I've always made it like a personal um, mantra to treat people the way that, you know, you want to be treated. So assistants, interns, um, you know, one day they could be working somewhere where you need a favor or they could be your future boss or, um, or they know somebody who knows a guy. So just, uh, just be nice and, um, and network and, uh, you know, make those connections. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you all. You know, I remember one tip uh, I got a long time ago on my resume. I thought I had the perfect resume, uh, you know, resident advisor, homecoming court, all these cool things. But I took it to a PR professional named Dave Nupper, who's based in San Diego at the time. And Dave pulled out his red pen and he went and slashed my resume. And he said, Scott, all I care about is where you interned, who are your clients and what were the results that you got? And that's all I needed to see on paper. The rest was the interview. I took my resume, I did what he said, and I gave it to Scott Allison. And again, I've been there for 30 years uh, working with him. So a couple of things to wrap up and then I'm gonna give it to Kay. First for everyone still on the line, this is great that you're all still here because every one of the panelists have agreed that they would love to be linked in with you. So I encourage you to link in with our panelists. In addition, they've agreed to take informational interviews and review your resume. So take that as a great opportunity. I encourage you to send something to all of us. I encourage you to stay in touch with people and let them know, just like Chris said, that you saw something and you thought about them. Uh, so as you have this opportunity, remember that we all become referral sources for you as well. So we may not be able to hire you, but we can look at your resumes, provide content, and maybe refer it to somebody else, uh, as was shared earlier. So I think that's really valuable. To get our attention, just write Broom Center on the, on the text or emails so that we see uh, Broom Center that knows that it's not some strange student coming from nowhere, but it's somebody who stayed here and watched the seminar. And I just, I can't thank uh, Kay and the folks at the Broom Center and PRSSA for providing us this opportunity to share this information with you today. And I personally look forward to hearing from any and all of you, if there are any questions that we weren't able to answer today on this uh, webinar that, again, ask that on LinkedIn, we're here to help. And with that, Kay, I'll turn it back over to you. And again, thank you everyone. Thank you panelists. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you for joining us on this webinar today. We obviously appreciate these fantastic pros for taking their time and investing in us. Um, I really felt that spirit of um, our namesake, Dr. Glenn Broom, in uh, all of the discussion about getting scrappy, hustling, showing grit, um, perseverance, and that's really what it's gonna take for us to move our, ourselves to the top of those resume stacks. Um, special thanks to our moderator, Scott Pansky, who created this entire 3P career series with us at the Broom Center. Um, like any PR event, we really wanna know how we did uh, so you're going to get a survey about this webinar. Please fill it out um, as soon as you get it and, and go all the way to the end. Um, if you can think of other ways that the Broom Center can help you, then holla at your girl, right? We're here for you. Um, we want to invest in you and we are all ears. We see how hard you're out there working and we know that an investment in you is an investment in our PR industry. Um, so thank you again. Stay scrappy and we'll see you on LinkedIn. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.